Good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the Guyana Business Journal and Caribbean Policy Consortium webinar on how Guyana can leverage its oil and gas revenues to build a world-class 21st century education system that links strongly to the best institutions in the world while fostering skills in critical local content areas. I'm Terrence Blackman, Associate Professor of Mathematics at Medgar Evers College in the City University of New York and founder of the Guyana Business Journal. And I'm joined today by Dr. David Lewis of the Caribbean Policy Consortium. Today's conversation will be led by Dr. Cardinal Ward, considered one of the world's leading experts on material devices and systems for optical information processing. A professor of electrical engineering at MIT, Professor Ward is the executive director of the Caribbean Science Foundation that is housed in the CARICOM Research Building at UV in the Cape Hill campus in Bridgeton, Barbados. We will, be, we will be also be joined by Professor Edward Green, uh, former UN Special Envoy and CARICOM De Deputy Secretary General, who is the Chancellor of the University of Guyana. Our third guest is Professor Paloma Mohammed. Professor Mohammed is the 11th Vice Chancellor of the University of Guyana. She is a full professor of behavior and communications, noted as a futurist for her work on change in both human and human systems. Of note, she is the first woman to lead the university in its 58 year history. And she is the first woman to be appointed vice chancellor at any university in the Anglophone Caribbean. Finally, we're joined by Dr. Leland Lucas, who is the Dean of the School of Entrepreneurship and Business Innovation at the University of Guyana. We hope to contextualize the implications of Guyana's emergence as a petrol state for its education sector, and more broadly, the education sector of the Caribbean region for critical stakeholders and audiences. Education is a cornerstone for Guyana's sustained growth and development. Uh, data from the 2021 first quarter report by the Center for Statistics in Guyana noted that approximately less than 2.5% of the Guyanese labor force possesses a bachelor's degree or, or equivalent. It is self-evident that the quality of Guyana's human capital and workforce is the cornerstone of Guyana's ability to advance sustainably, both socially and economically. And accordingly, this must be a task to which we deploy our oil and gas windfall. We examine in this, in this webinar the educational context, both globally and in the Caribbean, uh, educational imperatives for Guyana, the essential role of the University of Guyana in Guyana's educational transformation, and then we look at the School of Business Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you once again and to invite Dr. David Lewis to offer a few introductory remarks, which will be followed by Dr. Ward's lead-off presentation. Dr. Lewis. Good morning, colleagues uh, with us today on the webinar and uh, in Guyana, in the region internationally, thanks to the technology, the virtual technology we have today. Um, I'll be quick, but for me, uh, first and foremost, um, it, it's a privilege and an honor to be joined by uh, such world-class group of colleagues and friends uh, from the University of Guyana and from the region. Um, particularly because I'm involved with them already with the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the University of Guyana through the University of Guyana Foundation and also uh, with the founding some years ago of the School of Entrepreneur Entre Business Entrepreneurship and Innovation with Professor Lucas. So uh, for me, it's a, a, a personal engagement as well as a pr professional one. Uh, and one of the key things uh, we were interested with today's event is really the focus on education and human resource development and transformation for Guyana at this critical moment in time with the uh, energy resources, but beyond energy because of the great boom that has taken place in Guyana 
with regards to economic development, economic growth, and what I call the uh, technological catching up after decades of uh, not being able to engage directly in many of the benefits of regional educational development. And with that particularly, and I know we'll hear from our colleagues, on what that means for the transformation of the university as a 21st century agent of change and development uh, at the national level, but also at the regional level where we're already seeing Guyana's role as a regional actor transforming various, area, various areas of economic development. Uh, the most recent one being the agreement with Mount Sinai Hospital in New York for a overall health development program in the country. Uh, last but not least, um, I was reminded by one of our colleagues that decades ago, my father was a visiting professor at the University of Guyana and also served for many years as external examiner. Uh, and that's something that I always kept in mind when I first made my first visit to Guyana way back in 1982, uh, just to know where was this place that he was always doing work on in addition to the University of the West Indies. So thank you all again. Uh, enjoy our session, and we look forward to the discussion. So we will invite Cardinal Ward to lead us off, to give us sort of the global context. I, again, I must confess that I, I am a huge fan. I met uh, Professor Ward while I served as an MLK at MIT, and I've followed everything that he's written ever since. Uh, so Professor Ward, the floor is yours. Thanks, Professor Blackman. That has that was a long time ago, and um, I'm happy to have fans and disciples. And I'm a fan of yours also for all the great work that you're doing, you know, for Guyana and for the region, and also for your support of the work of the Caribbean Science Foundation, which is one of the organizations that I lead. I will try to be as brief as possible because I, I think I have about ten minutes to to make my remarks. But I want to thank all the colleagues here on the show because they clearly are dedicated to helping Guyana and to this mission that Guyana is on to reform its education system and develop its economy, which is things that certainly I've been proposing to the region since the early 1990s. And I noticed that one of my papers is, has been referenced with regard to this webinar, it's the, the paper that says creating a STEM-based economic pillar for the Caribbean, a blueprint, and it's on the Caribbean Science Foundation website under uh, CATSTE publications. But, and I'm gonna to stick to the theme of that paper because even though it was written, you know, many, many years ago, it's still very, very relevant. The strategy that I had outlined there for the development of the Caribbean region, which is to build a new economic pillar, not one based necessarily on oil and tourism or oil and natural gas or, or based on tourism. Those are the two pillars that we have established very firmly in the region. But there is a third economic pillar that can be built in order to, 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 to basically alleviate the, respond, the, the, the vulnerabilities we have with, with hurricanes, which disrupts tourism. Uh, terrorists did that same thing several years ago because people don't want to get on airplanes if they think they're going to be bombed and all the natural gas as you know the prices fluctuate up and down and a lot of countries and companies are talking about a future where we get away from fossil fuels so for all those reasons the, the not just guyana but the entire region should try to develop uh, alternative economic pillars and to do that of course you need a robust educational system and you need to build technology companies or, or home grow them or bring them in by whatever means and to get your scientists and engineers employed. We, we know at the present time that many of our students who go on to do science and engineering, they come back home and they can't find jobs. And that's sort of a resource that is wasted. It would be nice if they could come home to find jobs, but they can't find jobs because they didn't come back to create them and the, the jobs don't necessarily grow by osmosis. So, so the strategy that uh, I outlined in the paper, it talks about uh, attracting and home growing more technology companies, providing the infrastructure 
both technological infrastructure and maybe even legal infrastructure because starting a company in, the, in most of the countries in Guyana and the Caribbean is not easy. There's a lot of hoops to jump through, uh, a lot of red tape. It's a huge discouragement to start in a company. And so we also have to work on the legislative branch and get them involved in helping to make life easier. And the third, the third was to attract talent back home. A lot of our young people who are interested in science and engineering, they leave and they go abroad and most of them never come back. I guess you can sort of put me in that category. Although I'm in Barbados now and I, my home is of course, Cambridge, Massachusetts. But, uh, but I've been coming back to give back. And that's one of the reasons that I'm on the show today. But if we can get some of this talent back home and get them involved in entrepreneurship and starting companies, especially technology companies, that and, and I'm talking with technology companies that can have a global footprint because the man power companies are good and they will employ lots of, you know, sort of low skilled labor. But, uh, but to bring in lots of foreign exchange and to be able to make Guyana a first world country, some of that talent, not all of it's gonna come back, but as much as possible could come back home and indeed be encouraged to start companies and given the help, the assistance that I just talked about to start these companies. And because in the first world where a lot of them stay, they're developing cutting edge projects and products for large companies that, that have international and global markets. So there's no reason why they, they cannot come back and get something started. And we encourage that a lot. And of course, um, reforming the educational system, which I, I believe we're gonna talk a lot about today. And that's starting from the primary school all the way through tertiary. There's a chance with the revenues that we are having and expecting to grow from oil and natural gas to put a lot of the GDP into putting more STEM-based teaching and learning, and that includes training the teachers, that's really critical, in all of these schools from primary to tertiary. It's a good opportunity also to put uh, better labs in your high schools, and of course, labs in your tertiary institutions. Hands-on labs really turn students on. They're expensive, they're expensive to purchase at first, they're expensive to maintain, but you have to do it. And that would be revenues well spent if indeed that can be made a priority. Of course, I'm assuming that Guyana, like the rest of the Caribbean, are talking about coding and robotics in schools. So I'm not going to dwell on that. That's obvious. You've got to do that just to keep up with today's world. We want to generate a workforce for the future that uh, is skilled in not just computer programming, computer coding, as we call it, but also in maybe even making robots because the robots are replacing a lot of our workers and somebody's got to make the robots. So uh, that's a, an area that you shouldn't neglect. And I'm sure that Guyana is working in that direction in their schools. But to, to make a lot of this work, you need science popularization. The government needs to get the people involved and get the people to be passionate about the new direction that science and technology and where it can take Guyana. And, and so shows on TVs about, you know, simple things that you do in the home that use science and technology, but we don't think of it. Those are important. Science fairs, I'm sure you do those already. Um, in fact, uh, I should advertise now that I'm here, the Caribbean Science Foundation is holding a STEM Olympiad near the end of this year and it's now on our website, it's caribbeanscience.org. Oh no, it's not up yet, it'll be up, up in, a, in a couple of days, but it's gonna be caribbeanscience.org slash CSO, which stands for Caribbean STEM Olympiads. Anyway, um, and this would be a chance for Guyana and a lot of the other countries around the region to bring their best talent in science and technology and compete for prizes uh, at a regional level. So, so the science popularization, um, the, the work in the schools is, is, is very, very, very important. In order to home grow companies, you have to have the talent, they've got to be trained and university, you've got University of Guyana. So that should be given the resources, as I, as I just said, to grow and to 
hire more faculty and, and also bring in world-class faculty from the outside who may want to go on sabbatical and what a better place to go than Guyana. Now, wh why would they come to Guyana? Well, you have to have something there because they want to continue to publish while they come to Guyana. And, um, and, and so the, the professors and the other faculty that you have there should be trying to make those connections and, and trying to get these people to come because some of them might even stay if the environment is right. But, and this is why the research labs are important. Seeding the research labs in the university, not just for teaching, but maybe some monies for, to help your faculty start to do research will allow you to attract some of those people to Guyana and some of them will stay and work and may even bring their own money and write their own grants and bring in international funds for their grants as well. In fact, in my paper, I propose that one of the countries in the Caribbean could start a shared re regional research lab. It's an expensive proposition and Guyana might be the place to do it because it would be a lab with like four or five floors. There would be facilities for the biological sciences, for the engineering sciences, for the physical sciences, and of course, uh, computing resources, maybe with a supercomputer in it. Although today you have to be careful because you can do a lot on the cloud and you might not want to maybe buy a supercomputer, but that's a resource that industry can share, your universities can share it. People in Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad, Antigua can share it but it will be located in Guyana if you've got the resources to build it. So these are things that one can do to get it started. And finally, I would say Guyana should start something which looks like a small business innovation research program that funds companies, startup companies in science and technology. The USA does it, the program is called SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, and that company, that organization has created tons of jobs. So there's no reason why you couldn't put together something like this as well and have a scientific advisory board to advise the government on how to do it. And a lot of it is laid out in the paper that I just mentioned, which is, I saw uh, Dr. Blackman has put it on the, in the webinar somewhere. So for further reading, that explains a lot of my thoughts. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Professor Ward. Uh, you know, I think that you, in in the preparation for this show, and I think he's on, uh, he's 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 actually on the webinar at this moment. Uh, Ambassador Eugene Pursue from Grenada, mm -hmm. uh, he sent me a short note that said that in 1992, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Ashley Jackson had appointed him for negotiations for technology transfer mm -hmm. during the 1992 conference on mm -hmm. environment on the environment and development held in Rio. And, and he noted at that time that uh, we did not have much leverage and uh, the, the, the technology was sort of, you know, things that belonged nominally to private institutions. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I wanted to do was to, was to ask a Professor Green to, to sort of pick up on, on some, of the, uh, some of the suggestions of uh, Professor Ward, and, and 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 kind of give us a broader sense of, as you see them, the educational imperatives for Guyana at this moment. Uh, Prof <clears throat> Professor Chancellor Green. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, I was able to listen to most of um, of Colonel Ward's um, presentation, but I, I want to try to see if I can. Um, broaden the discussion a little because I was asked to speak on the imperatives of education. And in so doing, I think this webinar um, is taking place at a time when uh, the scale of oil and gas uh, discoveries in Guyana has globally been acknowledged as leading to unprecedented, um, an unprecedented boom and creating the fiscal space in the national budget to allow for spending on policies, especially on the types of educational programs that um, Professor Ward identified, but also uh, indicating that education, health infrastructure, environmental sustainability are all advanced by interest groups as contenders for, the, um, for what I will call the global, the golden opportunity. But looking at the imperatives for education, I, I want to uh, root my thinking 
in the UN report on sustainable development goals approved in um, 2015 by 192 um, states across the world. And, and in fact, it identified what is happening as the building blocks for every society. Uh, that is um, sustainable goal four. But sustainable goal four, which says ensuring inclusive, equitable, and quality education, um, and the promotion of lifelong learning opportunities for all, it recognizes several impediments for universal education, including the innovations to which uh, Professor Ward um, referred. But what it did also was to identify and address some targets which are important. And one of the targets would be how the returns, the rate of returns to education. And in particular, when I look at the current data that I was able to access, it shows that public spending on education in Guyana as a percentage of GDP is third behind Cuba and Barbados in the Caribbean. And the latest report, global report also shows that Guyana with an average of 4.45% of expenditure on GDP compares with the average of 145 countries in the, in the world. What is more, and what is very important is that um, the Guyana Educational Sector Plan 2021-25 is, is quite impressive in, in aligning with the Sustainable Development Goal 4 that I've just referred to. In addition, what it does, it recognizes how COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic led to accelerated plans for integrating ICT into the teaching and learning process, which is really an important, an important phenomenon. According to the Minister Manachan's foreword, and I quote, it provided the opportunity to reimagine learning and development and the resilient pedagogy of, um, that is needed to ensure that we can facilitate learning continuity during times of crisis. She also referred to an important aspect in the, um, the, 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 the uh, educational sector plan, and that was equity. And the plan is, seems to be steadfast in its aims to ensure that every student has access to quality education, regardless of race, income, national origin, ability and location. And, and this is very important for uh, executing some of the innovations to which Professor Ward uh, referred. But notwithstanding the trust, the education sector plan of, of Guyana, uh, one of the most striking paradoxes that we have to take into consideration as we move ahead is the resource curse of which Guyana must be mindful. Countries rich in non-renewable natural resources, uh, such as oil and minerals, have experienced, according to the overall analysis, slower economic growth than resource-poor countries. Many are far from reaching the, the education for all goals and other development targets. Now, this is an important cautious, caution in circumscribing what we call the imperatives uh, of education, not only in Guyana, but in developing countries. And after much consideration, um, it has led me to indicate that our emphasis should be placed on the wider issues of human development, which I think was implicit in what um, Professor Ward said, but more particularly on human capital development. Now, what is the justification for this imperative? Um, while the windfall from oil and gas is being projected to increase Guyana's GDP exponentially, it is also important to recognize um, the dissatisfaction with GDP as a measure of development. It has resulted in greater emphasis being placed on human development 
and the Human Development Index. The intention is to emphasize that people and their capabilities are and should be the ultimate criteria for assessing the development of a country and not economic growth alone. The summary measures that, that come up include um, key dimensions of human development, healthy life, long life, being knowledgeable, and having a decent standard of living. Um, conscious of the time, let me refer briefly to a couple of things that are very important in the education imperative. First of all, um, Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize, aptly describes development as a, creation, a, a way of creating freedom for people and removing obstacles to greater freedom. Um, he argues that greater freedom enables people to choose their own destiny and that obstacles to freedom, hence to development, include poverty, lack of economic opportunities, corruption, poor governance, lack of education, and lack of health. Now, now what this implies is that as feasible as a plan may be, there are these factors that must be addressed that unlock the obstacles to freedom. And in fact, uh, Guyana is anticipated um, the rapid growth in the new economy of Guyana that is anticipated is not an automatically sufficient guarantee of development. This is very important in limiting expectations of what the oil and gas boom can mean to the, the, the educational imperatives and to human capital outcomes. Now, let me just quickly refer you to some empirical work that elaborates on this. The Human Capital Project being promoted by the World Bank provides useful metrics that helps to standardize between human and economic development. The report, for example, um, shows concrete evidence from four countries. Singapore, for example, created a world-class education system with some of the highest learning outcomes. By 1990, for example, there was a 44% uh, enrollment in secondary education, a robust vocational training sector, which led to the consolidation of training centers into an institute of technical education, uh, somewhat like the innovation center that Professor Ward uh, referred to. At the university level, however, employers were engaged in curriculum and course design to ensure the response of graduates to market needs. The second in Peru, a long-term vision to reduce stunting in children paid great dividends. It reduced the chronic rate of malnutrition in children from 28% to 13% between 2005 and 2016, thus empowering women and in the poor and remote areas and the population and rural communities generally. In Ireland, the example shows that investment in human capital concentrated on linking jobs and skills and transforming the agrarian economy into an electronic, um, an electronic information uh, model for the world. At the same time, lessons from Korea shows that implementing all the human capital strategies led to dramatic change. So let me, given the, 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 the time dimension, let me just draw two quick conclusions. This human capital project that I refer to, which is ongoing uh, across the world, needs to be further explored. And I think Guyana needs to be involved um, as part of the identification of the relationship between the capabilities and capacity, which is self-leadership confidence. But the main storyline I want to end with is that developing countries like Guyana need to reorient their education systems to focus on meeting the evolving economic and labor market um, needs. And therefore, this is true of both 
the general track or academic education and the technical and vocational. But this is this needs to be pursued a little more, um, perhaps when when I come next time next time round, because what is important is some ideas put forward by the CARICOM Human Resource Development Strategy, which deals with the rate of return to education and the strategies for creating a broader base uh, imperative for education, not only in Guyana, but in the region. Thank you, Professor Green. Uh, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Mohammed, you're the executive and you get to put this into reality. So give us your thoughts on the essential role that the University of Ghana must play at this moment. Good morning and thank you very much. Um, I am going to respond to the very particular parts of today's discussion. Uh, first of all, how should Ghana leverage the oil and gas revenues and then the essential role of UG in Ghana's educational transformation. So one of the things that I want to point out just as by way of passing, but really important, is the monofocus that we are developing on oil revenues only. When Guyana has, uh, in the last two or three months, found two of the largest gold uh, strikes in the world. And while we have other sectors which are likely to contribute very significantly, um, rifting off of the oil revenues, um, as well as other traditional sectors, such as the agro sector. So I think that in the mix, all of these uh, revenue streams um, should be considered uh, in the conversation about resourcing education, in fact, resourcing anything in Guyana. Secondly, I want to address what might uh, we might define as a world-class education system, uh, because we at UG have been considering this recently, and when we created our Blueprint 2040, uh, this was one of the uh, key uh, considerations that we would have had. What exactly um, was the best uh, education uh, at the university level for Guyana uh, in the context of the region? and the context of the planet. So we might have argued that it's student engagement um, and we what we call uh, at UG student success is for us citizen success. We consider the student to be the raw material and the output for the university to be citizen success. And therefore uh, that means uh, a lot more than you know just working with a student and leaving them when they, they graduate. Uh, the education should really be fairly uh, flexible around student choice, personalization, uh, around authentic learning, having a global perspective, must also consider the needs of the student as well as those who provide the service, so the teachers and all those who support it. Um, and it must be relevant to the place, the moment and the future. And this is a tall order. So, but for, for, for us uh, and, and, and for most of us who study these, the question of uh, how resources impact and inflect human development, um, we consider uh, the fundamental um, attribute to be that of stability. And in as far as we can use those resources that will come to Ghana from all these various uh, places, um, probably primarily and I hope not only primarily um, oil and gas, um, we should be using our resources to achieve um, stability um, in which education can thrive um, and take off. I'd like to take this opportunity to read you a segment from UG's input into the uh, section on education, training and certification in the local content policy when we were asked to uh, review and to give our input. And I will quote here, it says, given the speed of development of Guyana's fields and discoveries and the emerging rapid changing global position on fossil fuels, it's imperative for the gaps uh, that these conditions have created in training and education, as well as output numbers in key local content areas in Guyana to be urgently filled. We know that um, Exxon and its partners basically uh, produced first oil about four years ahead 
um, of when it had ever been done in the country. And so this kind of left a lot of the uh, local uh, national institutions kind of on the back foot um, for, uh, so there's a, like a four year gap in, 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 at the moment that we're catching up with. I continue, in this regard, it's, an imp it's imperative that Guyana's local content policy intentionally foregrounds and caters for one industry, and that is education and training that can deliver the competent Guyanese in the numbers required in the shortest time for the country. It has already been noted by international specialists in this field that the process of building a technically competent workforce cannot be successful if it is done in isolation from the education systems that will be the source of the industry's employees for upwards of the next 25 years. To be effective, any competence measure or standard must be inclusive, robust, technically adroit, efficient, independently managed, and fair. The education and training infrastructure must therefore be developed as a true partnership. And here we speak to your question, to your point, uh, Terence, about linking with the best in the world, which we are doing and which we have to do. Um, so it cannot be developed as a true partnership with the local universities um, must be developed with, as a true partnership with local universities, training institutions, and technical vocational institutes, as well as operators and their service providers. This is imperative both if both the government of Guyana, the oil and gas companies here, are to attain local content requirements and targets laid out in the national policy. In order for field-ready graduates to emerge, there must be provisions for development and of or transfer of curriculum, knowledge, skills, and competent-based certification. This must also recognize and include provisions for support for early strategic collaborations, such as the labs that Professor was talking about, um, and the exchange. We do have, a, for instance, a Professors of Practice and uh, an, endow uh, an endowment uh, chair uh, program now at the university that is largely funded um, by um, the uh, oil companies, uh, basically GGI, which includes CNOC, Exxon, and um, HESS. Um, so we've begun to actually activate some of these things. Um, it, this, this policy must also recognize and include provisions for support for early strategic collaborations with established international educational players in the area. So we have recognized this, and we do have several that we're working with, including those in the region like UE and UGT. Um, Aberdeen and so on, uh, UTEC. The cost of this will be significant. However, by our modeling, it is likely to be 55% less than training huge numbers of persons overseas and should be seen as an investment in the future of the local workforce uh, development and training capacity. The multiplier effects and spin offs of this sector su that supplies other important sectors of the national economy should also not be underestimated. And here we have the local content uh, kind of targets for education that the government has set out in their policy. And it, it basically goes from secondary education, uh, which it really should go way, all the way back to nursery. I don't even think that primary, I, I think primary might be a little late. And I can explain that at another forum. Um, but it says that by in, in, in 10 years time, they would we would expect that at the secondary level, tech voc level, um, specialist education, certainly, certainly at the level of university and services such as hospitality and so on, they've given 10 years um, for all of the training to be done um, in Guyana um, in certain areas. But in the first three years, uh, they are saying uh, work, they're targeting 20 percent and at the un between 20 and 40 percent at the university level, 40 percent. I would want to argue that given the context and, the, and where we are at this moment, um, where we have to really look, basically uh, multiply our workforce by four, 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 four times, 400%, um, to maybe about 50,000 in the first five years. Um, we really need to consider uh, both rapid but robust upskilling in sector, in certain sectors, and that, um, the question of how this is done, it has to be a mix between uh, companies that are, or institutions that are in Guyana and those that are going to uh, come in and help and those we're going to link with. 
Fundamentally, however, um, I think that the question of uh, how what needs to be developed really goes around um, in, in, in this way. And we have four critical development imperatives before I close for UG that I'd like to leave with you. So the general comment on, on, on specific to Guyana and, uh, is that not only UG uh, needs to be resourced, but UG is the one that's here, that's stable, and that is, is going to be able to produce in the gap in the next five years. So whoever and whatever is going to come in will have, uh, have to set up, and they also will take a few years to produce, but we're already producing. And so therefore, we need to really consider and ensure that UG does have its the ability to scale up in very critical areas. Um, so we think that about 60% in the first 60% of investment in tertiary education needs to go to uh, the UG, to Guyana Technical Institute, to, to the um, vocational schools like BIT, GCIS, agriculture, um, uh, the School for Agriculture, and so on, so that we can scale up all, uh, very, very significantly, about 30% of the investment to offshore and 20% international. So that's the model of spend that we are we believe should happen. Um, so um, the of course the question of the uh, the place of UG and what UG needs to do. UG has been holding this economy up um, and giving back uh, much more than it's been invested in it, in it, although a lot has been invested in it for the last 59 years. We'll be 60 in a couple of, of months in October. And uh, if you if you begin to look at the repatriation of monies to Guyana from UG grads who have traveled overseas, and of course the, um, the, the investment uh, uh, contribution to Guyanese of graduates of the university, I think the role uh, of the university cannot be overstated. And in this particular moment, it is perhaps the most significant national strategic asset we have in terms of workforce design and development. If we look at Porter's 17-point um, list um, of uh, competitive imperatives for Guyana, you will, we will note that at the top of it, he calls about, he talks about the human infrastructure and that is self-sustaining human infrastructure has to be in place if we are going to take off. And so the university is the central of that. So the four imperatives that I would have wanted to uh, address um, that the university would need, and I think that speakers uh, before me would have spoken to these uh, in different ways. So the first thing is staffing. This is very important, uh, essential, uh, it's a, it's, we have to really um, be able to retain um, our staff and students. The salaries and conditions um, have to be better, and especially in a competitive national and regional uh, situation, what we will find if we don't resource the university staff in, and give them better conditions is that they will be attracted away um, from the sector as has already begun to happen. And this will be a double indemnity um, on, on, on the country because we will just be um, kind of floundering for persons who are able to teach. And if we are, in, in, if we are going to attract international uh, scholars as we need to do and we've begun to do, they will have to be paid uh, uh, decently as well. And so uh, we really need to look at parity between, you know, of, of, of conditions of salaries. The second is the, the intentional recruitment and a pipeline plan because the universities and higher tertiary institutions are really, uh, we collect, we, 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 we collect from the feeders. And so um, one of the things that we really have to consider and the university itself has begun to do this. For instance, we just ended our first RAZOR program, which is a regional STEM accelerator where we have hundred children from across the region ages 9 to, to 13 are uh, working in our labs at the university residential for two weeks um, on um, hoping to keep them in STEM and keep them excited as professor had said um, by the things that you could do in a lab and the outcome of that is that the Ministry of Education will outfit about 30 schools in the hinterland regions that did not have um, science labs before. And that is going to happen by the time school opens. So we are actually at, at the university stimulating, working very, very um, carefully. I've also been advocating for a technology stream in schools, um, but is specific to technology. Um, 
And I hope somebody is going to listen to me in that in this regard. And that this should start from the uh, as early as nursery because children nowadays they 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 they're interface with technology, they understand it. And if you can uh, build build a curriculum from very early and interest from very early, I think we'll be able to see more. We also have to strengthen the teachers. We don't have enough science teachers in 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 in, in the region in the country. And we did also bring 20 uh, science teachers to, to our, our, our STEM camp um, uh, this, this, this um, summer, uh, just a few weeks ago. And um, that is, um, I think that was, is going to help to stimulate some of them to come into STEM and to stay in STEM. Then we have infrastructure. Um, we cannot, uh, the University of Ghana's infrastructure is uh, basically 60 years old, most of it, and failing, and most of it, especially in science and tech, was designed for really, really small classes. Um, so 20 and 15, and we now have to scale up. We cannot keep up with the demand, for instance, for our engineers, um, our, our persons in, 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 in computing and so on. But increasingly, we also are getting huge uh, demands for the support services. So, so international relations, languages, economics, finance and those things because you do have this 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 um, large uh, body of services that support these industries and we, we still need to support them so I don't want to overemphasize that only because the others are equally important right and then this all this big uh, big idea of research um, one of the first things that happened with the University of Diana in 20 around 2019 2009 2010 when i first came to came back home to ug was that the research budget was 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 cut we had no research budget this might be something that seems absolutely incredible to anyone in a university we had no no research budget um, because when we met financial difficulties this was the first thing that went and it stayed gone until about two and a half years ago when i became vice chancellor and insisted that this was impossible, we couldn't do this. And we were supported um, for some of the research things we we're doing, including putting in things like molecular labs, genetic labs, and so on by the oil industry. Um, and you will see those uh, kind of launches coming up, but also by helping us to find and staff some of our uh, professors of practice in areas that were critical that we wanted to support over the next three to five years. And this is an ongoing project. But research funding for not only labs, but for attracting persons who are good researchers, who can train and help our, 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 our staff to go along that path. And for policy design and review is absolutely important. I should say that we, all, we have stood up a few research institutes in the last three years, which are doing well. And one of them is kind of akin to what Professor was talking about, which is UG Irie, which is the um, Institute for Research uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, which is led by our first professor of practice funded by um, GGI Project, which is Professor Patsy Francis. And they have done a science and one science and innovation <laughs> uh, uh, exhibition already with 40 inventions of students and staff at the university uh, just about two months ago, just after two years of standing up. We also have the Institute for Human Resilience strategic security and the future, which is working on things like space, working on a genet, uh, our genetic, our ARC, um, which is our project for collecting all our genetic uh, molecular, genetic material in the country and storing them at UG for other reasons. So we're getting there. But the point is that we really have to um, consider uh, the university as and the university system because we have several other uh, institutes and so on that are around the University of Ghana, but also the tertiary education system, the entire education system, going all the way back to nursery, as really, really significant for, 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 for uh, investment, but also really the linchpin for any kind of uh, development that is sustainable in Guyana for the long term. And I will end here. Thank you. Uh, VC. Fluma Mohammed, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think you've you've made the point, and I think this is the point that uh, that, that has has been, folks have been trying to amplify. The University of Guyana is essential uh, to the long term sustainability of Guyana. It it is already in the space. Anything else that starts will take five years before it gets going, and so it has it is in the space. It has the expertise, and and its people in some way. Are, are, are need to be thought of 
as first in line for this process that we're engaged in this transformation process. And it's in that sense that I wanted to, I know that uh, the, the School of Business and Innovation, Professor Lucas, is something that is akin to this journey that that, that VC Muhammad had Martin has laid out. And so I wanted to uh, give you the next 10 minutes to, to just talk about the school that you lead. Professor well, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. I had a bit of a delay. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, good morning. Um, and to some extent, please forgive me if I seem to be repeating some of the thoughts um, which have already been laid out. Um, you know, as we speak about this concept of um, what is happening in Guyana, one of the things that I think we need to do is move away from this obsession with growth and focus on development, because it's actually about development that will really take this country forward. And education is part of the conversation about development. If we look at what is happening in Guyana right now, <laughs> to some extent, I think that I'm seeing a bit of history kind of repeating itself. I do recall the days when we nationalized the several industries. And part of the reason why that nationalization initiative failed is because we did not have the human capital to really run those operations. We're not nationalizing oil and gas, but oil and gas is so critical to us at this point in time and going forward, particularly in a sustainable development framework that we once again find ourselves without the necessary human capital to really take advantage of the opportunities that present, present themselves. And so the question for me, and I think the question for the educational system, is how quickly do we ramp up to ensure that the kinds of gaps that we have experienced in the past, um, that we can correct those errors. Yes, we, for some time now, we have not really had a a human capital development strategy in place. And so we will always have to be playing catch up because of that. But being successful call requires that we look at this in terms of what can be done to provide the nation with the human capital that is needed to take advantage of this new system economy, whether it be in terms of local content or beyond. And I would make the argument that we're actually looking at things that go beyond local content because oil and gas is only one sector of the economy. We've got other sectors of the economy, agriculture, we've got other natural resources, we've got an IT sector. So what are the things we need to do in order to ensure that we have the human capital that is necessary? Um, we, like the rest of the world, have gone through a very unfortunate experience called COVID-19, the pandemic. But one of the things that the pandemic has actually done for us as an academic institution is helped us to understand what are the innovative things we can do to attract the best and the brightest. And I heard one of my colleagues um, speak about the importance of sabbaticals. And the unique thing about gaining access to the best qualified is that many of them do not necessarily need to travel to Guyana. They can provide a lot of their services and knowledge, not only to the students of Guy in Guyana and the University of Guyana, but throughout the system. Virtually, we have been conducting sign a significant number of our classes, and this is the pattern that we will have going forward. So that gives us immediate access to a wealth of knowledge that can better inform our students as to what is on the cutting edge of research. What are the things that they need to do and to learn in order to move forward? But as we look at that, we also have to ask ourselves in terms of that staffing that is necessary to build the human capital in this country, and especially the University of Guyana. We have to differentiate between what are the things we are going to do on a temporary basis and what are the things we're going to do on a permanent basis. Yes, there are a number of things we can do on a temporary basis, 
but then with the ch as well as the permanent basis but what as as the economy goes through this push and pull framework that we find ourselves dealing with where whether we attract people by offering them significantly higher salaries which is necessary we will never be able to compete with the private sector and so you've got that challenge and so what are the things we need to do or the system will allow us to do in terms of ensuring that there's a process for knowledge transfer. In essence, you come into the system, you participate in the system, but what happens in the system that you bring to the system stays within the system and does not leave when you transition. And so I think those things are extremely important for us to think about. How we take advantage of the opportunities, the role of the diaspora, um, not only in terms of education, but also in terms of new business development. The diaspora, for instance, no longer needs to be on the ground in order to participate in new business activity. I know there's some concern about what is local content and how we define local content and the participation of those who may be in the diaspora. But those are things we can work around because there is no perfect local content legislation that exists. What is important is for us to find ways in which the diaspora can get involved in the development of new businesses. But as I transition now to a conversation about SEBI's role in the development of new businesses, Yes, we can train individuals, and we have been training individuals, to launch their new businesses and be successful. But the other side of the creation of that new business is a problem that we have in the society which has to be addressed, and that is access to capital. We still have a fairly, and forgive me for using this phrase, archaic banking system. Um, if someone comes in from the diaspora and says, I want to pump $10 million into this new business that I think is interesting. And you go through the regular banking system. Now you're being told things like you need a letter from your employer. You need to prove where you're getting this money from. You need references, etc. We know those things don't work in the systems that are progressive. And so I'm suggesting that there has to be changes with, of a legislative nature that allow the banking system to deal with the reality of the economy in which we are operating. If an investor has a choice between going through that and going maybe to Barbados or somewhere else and being able to rapidly make an investment in a new business, that individual to go where there is the least amount of resistance, institutional resistance to being successful. I think we've also got to look at the kinds of financial instruments that we have within Guyana. For instance, we don't we have a stock market, but we don't have a small cap. So if I want to launch a new business and I'm looking for about $15 million, there's nowhere in the market that I can go to and get access to that money, those monies. And so we need to start having a conversation and accelerating that conversation, in fact in terms of what new financial instruments and how quickly we can introduce those financial instruments. The, what is the role of angel investors? What is the role of venture capitalists? How do we design incubators, business incubators? Um, and I think the University of Guyana is in an ideal place for us to establish business incubators. But those business incubators must not just be an area that is carved out for us so that individuals can go in there and try with their business ideas and see what comes out of it. I think the other aspect is to ensure that we have the new financial instruments and we have individuals who have that capacity to provide the new financial instruments who are within that incubator space. So. I think these are all things that we need to do going forward. The University of Guyana has always been, I would say, Guyana's little secret. Um, the world has benefited from the University of Guyana's production 
In fact, I make the point in some circles that we fail to recognize that our greatest export is not sugar, it's not rice, it's not bauxite, it's not gold, it's our human capital. Because of what has been happening, we now have an opportunity to see a return on our investment. And that return on our investment does not necessarily require a physical presence, but it can also come through the virtual means. And so Guyana is, you know, the University of Guyana is in that very unique space. We know what works. We are innovative. We have a management team that, th that looks at things as not what is, but what can be. And so we're very fortunate to be in that position. And so I think we are poised to garner the resources once they are provided to ensure that what this nation needs, whether it be oil and gas sector or any other economic sector, that it can be provided. But it's going to be a journey that we have to go through. We've also got to boost the other majors that we've got. Um, I did have a conversation about a, uh, two years ago with retired Major General Joe Singh, who was concerned that he had gone to QC to give a pep talk before the CSEC CAPE exams and was stunned at the small number of students who are taking exams in geography and history. So when we talk about developing the human capital and providing the University of Guyana with the resources that it needs in order to be successful and make this nation as great as it can possibly be, it's not just about providing the resources for STEM. It's not about just providing the resources for the oil and gas sector. You know, I, I like to talk about STEAM science, technology, engineering, agriculture, and math. Um, it's also about helping us to understand that our history is part of what will make us successful. Um, understanding the geography of the country is also important to understanding where we are and where we will be going. <coughs> Excuse me. And so at the expense of seeming to be rambling, um, I think it's very important for us to understand that what is required is a holistic view of how we are going to approach this issue of dealing with human capital and providing the nation with what it needs. And equally important is for us to remember that that world-class world educational system does not begin at UG. It does not begin at the high school level. It begins in the home and also at the kindergarten levels. And so the changes that we have to make within the education system will have to incorporate changes that affect the home environment so that the individual who is not as well off as the more wealthy individuals can have the kind of access to resources that gives them an equal opportunity to be provided with a world-class education. As I tell some co colleagues of mine, even at the high school level, um, the light bulb doesn't necessarily go on for everybody at the same time. And so we have to find a way to work with everyone and bring them forward so that this country can really be as successful as it, as it can be. And that education, which is the foundation of everything that we do, um, can really be provided in a manner that may helps to make this country great. So that what the University of Guyana has taught, wants to do, and the Vice Chancellor has not mentioned this, <coughs> excuse me, of having at least one graduate per household, at least one graduate per household. Yes, we recognize that not everybody will go to college and maybe we'll have to expand our definition of that household. But the concept of having one graduate per household is so important to ensuring that this country can become as great as it can be. And so 
that's my um, contribution. I hope I have not bored. Well, uh, my no, no, no. So let me let me first uh, uh, say to the audience: there have been lots of questions uh, coming in from people to say we're going to extend just a little, so that I, at least I can pose some of those questions. So I wanted to give David a chance. Maybe if you can kind of connect connect these presentations together, and as you connect, I will pop a few of the questions that have come on, and then we will try to see how many of them we can answer. That would so probably be the most value so. added. I, I would only add two quick points to this wonderful exposition from all our, our speakers today. Uh, one, the clear need uh, underlying all this is strategic alliances across sectors, not only in education, but as we've been discussing business uh, at all the levels of education and beyond just the oil and gas sector and, and, and how that can be built. I know already there's one excellent example where we have a uh, UG collaborating with Florida International University, a Guyanese professor, Norman Munro, to develop the all the accreditation for the engineering school. And that's a wonderful initiative. And there's probably many more like that that can be uh, advanced, but really advancing that strategic alliance across uh, different areas. And also what that means in terms of what we see in, in many other markets that have grown where institutions have been able to mature, the whole issue of the, the public intellectual discourse, think tanks, the diaspora, uh, the role of leadership in that, and particularly what we're seeing um, to, to counter what we see a lot in the, in the sensationalist media in Guyana, which is really to focus on the role of education and of these institutions in fomenting and uh, advancing facts-based, research-based analysis and discussion of all these issues, not only in the oil and gas sector, but across what's taken place in Guyana, because at the end of the day, that really is the, the goal of science, education, and training, to really the imperative of facts-based discussions among all in the society. So let, let's go ahead through that discussion and uh, focus more on that, I think, uh, Terence. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, David. So we, we've had a tremendous amount of questions come in and I've been trying to kick through them uh, so that you can see, but I, I'll start with this one for, uh, uh, for, for, for VC Mohammed. Uh, you have in the audience an adjunct at Texas A&M Law School and thinks that due to the oil industry and its large international relations programs, both an institution like Texas A&M and the Texas University System, uh, which has a special office for exchanges, would be interested in working with the University of Guyana. So, so, so obvious question: Have you been in touch with the folks in Texas? Yes, they uh, have in been in touch. Uh, yeah. They have been in touch with us, um, and in fact, we are working. Um, in fact, they are working very closely with the Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, and so, a very curious thing is happening in the training space, where. Um, uh, some ministries are running their own training programs and um, uh, the way in which the university is um, involved in those is being worked out now. And so we have been in touch with Texas A&M though. We've had two meetings with them. Um, we've, we have been in touch with several um, uh, international schools that are, are, are very... Um, have been involved in training for oil and gas in many regards. Aberdeen University, for instance, uh, we have set up our Institute for Energy Diplomacy, and it's, it's in particular in the area of um, energy law and oil and gas law. Our Department of Law is about to launch what we call some um, some short programs and uh, postgraduate certificates that are around this area, these areas. So we have been in touch with them, but the ways in which they are some of these universities are engaging with ug are um i would say um interesting at this moment they, they're, they're being worked out at them at this point in time but we are so there was one question about a, a, a skills map uh you know as we as we talk about the the the, yes. the match between the resources and the capacity uh i'm i'm trying to find the so the question is here. Uh, is there is there something that we can be pointed to that that is there a skills mapping exercise that is yeah. that is currently being conducted? So uh, so the University of Ghana did one uh, its own 
um, in 2018 on the Pro Professor I Ivlon Griffith, who was vice chancellor at the time. The IDB has done one, but the government of Guyana has engaged a, an, an Indian consultant who's, who's going to be here for the next two years, who is working through the Ministry of Labor on um, a, a, a skills map at this moment. So, so the, the, the other questions, so I'm, I'm going them through. So is there, a, you know, what's the best way for at least as we see, I mean, I, I, perhaps this is where I was going, uh, you know, thinking through how do you get resources for, you know, staff for research for, I mean, is it through the government or is it, or is there an opportunity to independently partner, so to speak, uh, well, with, yeah. So our uh, our uh, resource uh, uh, co co is is um, composition is sixty percent government of Guyana, um, about twenty percent fees, and that of course, if you go to free education, I saw somebody had a question about free education. If you go to free education, you immediately take that twenty twenty five percent away from the university, which is already struggling for funds. Um, so that's a big problem for us. Um, and also, of course, the fact that our fees are capped and we do not deliver education at market value. We, deli we deliver way below, about 3,000% below um, uh, what it actually costs us. Um, <clears throat> so this is also something to be considered. And then, of course, we're increasingly um, uh, getting support from um, this oil industry in particular, um, uh, in, in, in particular areas. Certainly GTI, ExxonMobil, CGX have been really supportive and some of their um, service providers like Halliburton, Stumber J um, and so on have supported scholarships for students, um, have supported labs and so on, but nobody wants to fund salaries. The only way in which we've got salaries funded are through the uh, endowed chairs and professors of practice. Um, and that, of course, does not speak to the entire university uh, population. In fact, what it has the potential for doing is creating a lot of tension between those people we bring in on the, those programs who are paid better, but not, and the, and not the, wonderfully and paid. Local, and and better folks who are local, yes. And then the ones who are there. Yeah, so we yeah, always yeah. have to consistently try to manage that. The money yeah. for, um, for, for the universities, um, I think the fundamental salaries and wages for staff, and support staff has to come from from the government we're a state university and everything else we're raising you know we could raise funds around but you know philanthropic and other funds are very unstable it's they're risky so you can't uh really plug unless you're going to have an endowment which the foundation is trying to do you can't really put your those those capital recurring uh, and those recurring costs um on philanthropy you've got to really um have an investment by some set of people um and i think led by the government and really and truly this is this is a big 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 question right a very big question so professor green uh slater jeffrey seems to have a question which in a way aligns mm -hmm. with some of the sdgs that uh, uh so he was sort of modeling and somehow modeling a program modeling a curriculum for training programs for the village economy modeled on the village economy what are your thoughts in this regard how, how does well I, I i think this is a very interesting um perspective um because if you would recall um i, I was indicating how impressed i was with the education sector plan because it seemed to have captured the need for investing in education with equity. And to do so means that uh, you have to look at the various entry points and really try not to leave people behind. And therefore, um, education pitched to at this level um, where there's an identified low level of literacy is very important. But I noted, I noted that it is referencing literacy among small business owners. And I, I wondered if in the um, IRI, the, 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 um, the policies developed by IRI, and to less extent city, if this isn't what they're grappling with, how do you try to uplift uh, the literacy uh, of, of people? And I, I heard when um, Professor um, Leland spoke that he stressed this kind of flexibility 
in, in the programs. But I really agree that this is an important way to deal with investing in education with equity. So I, I want to... May, may I make a brief contribution to this? Uh, yes, please, please go um, it, it, It's interesting that um, Slater has posed this question because Slater and I have been engaged in a conversation on exactly this and we just haven't been able to move it forward. And yes, there is a role not only for SEBI but also for UG Irie. Um, but there are also organizations out there that, um, that are working on this same kind of stuff. For instance, at Padaji. Um, is doing some of this stuff as well. I would also um, like to let the audience know that on Saturday, I was asked to make a small presentation at the Buxton Friendship um, Museum um, Society. I can't remember the full name. Um, and I specifically to a group of individuals for a group of individuals who were graduating with some IT training. And I emphasized some of these very points, the needs um, to have this kind of training. And I'm also happy to say that at that very presentation, um, the Honorable President, Dr. Irfan Ali, made a commitment um, to supporting these kinds of initiatives. And there was actually a representative from BIT who indicated that um, that additional training would be available within another few days that individuals could participate in. So all of these conversations are taking place at a time, I think, when there's a great deal of awareness as to what has to be done. Um, the thing now is to turn on the, you know, to just turn the knobs and make so, sure- So I want to use this as a, as a kind of place to, <laughs> Come back to the beginning. So David Modest asks a very interesting question. You know, what are the opportunities to think about the local content policy design that is based on a long-term view for Guyana? You know, so in, in, in his world, specifically accounting for oil and gas as a, a short-term factor and looking at what we want to see for Guyana. So one can imagine a two-generation thing. And then where do you go there after that? And so I, I want to come back to the very beginning, with ask, to ask Professor Ward to kind of reiterate sort of some of what he has said, and then each person to just have a minute, just one minute to kind of respond in a way to David's sort of long view question about how do we sustain this over an extended period of time? And then finally, we'll come back to, we'll come back to David and have him sort of close us up. So I'll, I'll exit and David will exit and I'll give you guys a chance to Okay, thanks Professor Blackman for bringing me back in. Yes, and in my comments, I assume that the oil and gas will one day be gone or that the rest of the world will have moved on and somehow have solved the renewable energy problem, which I don't think is gonna be solved as quickly as we think it is. I think we're gonna be on fossil fuels for a while. But, and this is why I focused on, on using some of the resources you have, and I'm happy to hear that gold is one of them, but using the resources that you have to, to diversify your economy now. And yes, we all agree education is the key and, and developing the workforce for the future is the key towards diversifying the economy and el eliminating poverty because it's hard if you're hungry to be focused on learning, right? So, and, and so my comments, which focused a lot on STEM, I saw that as in addition to not instead of, because you, you need to, have a whole person and so all the, all the other areas are important i mean even at mit we, we, people think of us as a technological university but in my department electrical engineering every student has and this actually this is true for the whole of mit there are eight semesters of humanities you have to take just to get an engineering degree and in my department in particular there's an oral communications component that every student has to take to get a degree in electrical engineering and computer science so so yeah, I think Guyana has to pretend that these resources are not going to be here forever and to use those resources now to make sure that you do some of the things that you may never have another chance to do. And I think a lot of those are in the STEM related area because it's very expensive to educate students in STEM and to do research in STEM and to build new companies in STEM. It's, it's not going to be cheap if I can use that word. 
not at the expense of doing the other things. You got to continue doing what you're doing and UG is doing a good job in all those other areas and need more resources. So I recognize that. But uh, I just want to reinforce as Professor Blackman said that uh, think of this as a single unique opportunity in time. I hope it's not, but just in case. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I just wanted to say thank you for that and to simply say um, we, when we speak about the University of Ghana, we are talking about a University of Ghana system. And to the questions that have been popping up um, about what happens um, prior to the university, we have the Institutes for Distance and Continuing Education, which is our big um, vocational and pre-university um, extramural um, system, six campuses across the country. So from that place, we also affect, <coughs> excuse me, we also affect what's happening um, at other levels. Sorry, I'm recovering from something pretty nasty I got last week, so I'm sorry for talking. But also, I wanted to also indicate that really and truly, and to make the point that any sustainable plan really has to be about people, the, the human infrastructure of a country is what will, will ensure its sustainability. Whether those people are in country, out of country, they move around. Buildings need more care, they will decay. People multiply, sustain, uh, go other places and enlarge what you invest. <coughs> so with regard to the University of Guyana and all those other tertiary institutions, and we always argue the university argues for resources for Karukuru College, I did see that, for the technical institutes, for other vocational um, programs in the country, that they all should be resourced. And anytime we have a voice, we speak on behalf of those persons as well, who might, might not be in the room. Because as we say, we have a diversified population, we have diversified needs, but um, we have to address all of those. So I'm going to stop now. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, I wanted to support <clears throat> that and, and in responding to the long view proposed by <clears throat> Lewis, it, it, is, it is very clear that um, it is important for us to recognize that we must take that, it, that we must take education as an investment in human development. And I think that resonates with what the VC said and with what, um, with, with what um, Professor Lucas as well as Professor Ward said. But what really got to me is that we must take into consideration both the capabilities of people, their skills, knowledge and behaviors, and their capacities, like things like self-leadership, confidence, motivation, resilience, and mindset. I think that is the conjecture uh, or the confluence, so, so to speak, of the inputs in human development. But there is a compounding, a compounding issue that no metric of human development can adequately explain. And I want to end with this because sometimes we leave it out just as we leave out history and geography. It is the effect of culture on the consciousness about life and social relations in both economic and political activities in a society. And this includes the intangibles like values, social consciousness, morality. It is difficult to build a culture in isolation with this social reality. And therefore I'm saying that we too, as we look at whatever we do in education and human development, Culture, the development of, of cultural robustness has its own particularity and will evolve into economic and political practice. Um, this is how really I interpret the essence of human development underlying all the things that we were speaking about today. Chancellor, I feel... <laughs> I, I feel as though I should say nothing more, um, because that, <laughs> that in essence sums up was, what we are that dealing was, with. That was that was pithy yeah. and pithy um, I'll and say things. nothing more, Chancellor. All of the good Thank things. Uh, I was just thinking, David. I think that that's a cue for you to take us home and say thank you on our behalf. 
Yeah. Yes, no, this was wonderful, and I really appreciate the contributions of all our colleagues uh, and friends, and uh, just advocate for everyone online with us to reach out. Um, I've been work. I've had the privilege to be working with the university for some years now. There's a what you see and what you've heard today is true, and indeed, if you reach out, you will be able to advance that collaboration at many of the levels discussed. I think we've only begun to scratch that surface, as the vice chancellor mentioned. But we've got a, a, a wealth of experience, not only in Guyana, but in the rest of the region, as Professor Ward mentioned. And I think that really bodes well for the developments taking place at the broad educational level in Guyana and the Caribbean as a whole. So thank you all very much for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Uh, Guyana Business Journal, and please be well. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Have a pleasant Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Okay. Bye, bye bye. And thanks again. Thanks, Terrence. Got it. Um, am I leaving? How do I leave?